Mina Harker's Journal 22nd September In the train to Exeter Jonathan sleeping It seems only yesterday that the last entry was made and yet how much between then in Whitby and all the world before me Jonathan away and no news of him and now married to Jonathan Jonathan a solicitor a partner rich master of his business Mr Hawkins dead and buried and Jonathan with another attack that may harm him some day he may ask me about it down it all goes i am rusty in my short hand see what unexpected prosperity does for us so it may be as well to freshen it up again with an exercise anyhow the service was very simple and very solemn there were only ourselves and the servants there one or two old friends of his from exeter his london agent and a gentleman representing sir john paxton the president of the incorporated law society jonathan and i stood hand in hand and we felt that our best and dearest friend was gone from us we came back to town quietly taking a bus to hyde park corner Jonathan thought it would interest me to go into the row for a while so we sat down but there were very few people there and it was sad looking and desolate to see so many empty chairs it made us think of the empty chair at home so we got up and walked down piccadilly Jonathan was holding me by the arm the way he used to in old days before i went to school I felt it very improper for you can't go on for some years teaching etiquette and decorum to other girls without the pedantry of it biting into yourself a bit but it was Jonathan and he was my husband and we didn't know anybody who saw us and we didn't care if they did so on we walked I was looking at a very beautiful girl in a big cartwheel hat sitting in a victoria outside giuliano's when i felt jonathan clutch my arm so tight that he hurt me and he said under his breath my god i am always anxious about jonathan for i fear that some nervous fit may upset him again so i turned to him quickly and asked him what it was that disturbed him he was very pale and his eyes seemed bulging out as half in terror and half in amazement he gazed at a tall thin man with a beaky nose and black mustache and pointed beard who was also observing the pretty girl he was looking at her so hard that he did not see either of us and so i had a good view of him his face was not a good face it was hard and cruel and sensual and his big white teeth that looked all the whiter because his lips were so red were pointed like an animal's Jonathan kept staring at him till I was afraid he would notice I feared he might take it ill he looked so fierce and nasty I asked Jonathan why he was disturbed and he answered evidently thinking that I knew as much about it as he did Do you see who it is No dear I said I don't know him who is it his answer seemed to shock and thrill me for it was said as if he did not know that it was to me mina to whom he was speaking it is the man himself the poor dear was evidently 
terrified at something, very greatly terrified. I do believe that if he had not had me to lean on and to support him, he would have sunk down. He kept staring. A man came out of the shop with a small parcel and gave it to the lady who then drove off. The dark man kept his eyes fixed on her and when the carriage moved up Piccadilly he followed in the same direction and hailed a hansom. Jonathan kept looking after him and said, as if to himself, I believe it is the Count, but he has grown young. My God, if this be so, oh my God, oh my God, if I only knew, if I only knew. He was distressing himself so much that I feared to keep his mind on the subject by asking him any questions, so I remained silent. I drew him away quietly and he, holding my arm, came easily. We walked a little further and then went in and sat for a while in the green park. It was a hot day for autumn and there was a comfortable seat in a shady place. After a few minutes staring at nothing, Jonathan's eyes closed and he went quietly into a sleep with his head on my shoulder. I thought it was the best thing for him, so did not disturb him. In about twenty minutes he woke up and said to me quite cheerfully, Why, Mina, have I been asleep? Oh, do forgive me for being so rude. Come, and we'll have a cup of tea somewhere. He had evidently forgotten all about the dark stranger, as in his illness he had forgotten all that this episode had reminded him of. I don't like this lapsing into forgetfulness. It may make or continue some injury to the brain. I must not ask him, for fear I shall do more harm than good. I somehow must learn the facts of his journey abroad. The time is come, I fear, when I must open that parcel and know what is written. Oh, Jonathan, you will, I know, forgive me if I do wrong, but it is for your own dear sake. Later. A sad homecoming in every way. The house empty of the dear soul who was so good to us. Jonathan, still pale and dizzy under a slight relapse of his malady. And now, a telegram from Van Helsing, whoever he may be. You will be grieved to hear that Mrs. Westenra died five days ago and that Lucy died the day before yesterday. They were both buried today. Oh, what a wealth of sorrow in a few words. Poor Mrs. Westenra, poor Lucy, gone, gone, never to return to us. And poor, poor Arthur, to have lost such sweetness out of his life. God help us all to bear our troubles.' 